Hey folks, this is Echo. The wait is over and Alpha 21 has arrived. For many players, this may not be the Alpha that you are looking for, but I do believe it is the Alpha that we all needed. Like many of you, I've had my concerns, but I'm going to walk you through all the new updates and tell you why I see this Alpha as an absolute game changer. To kick things off, we're going to talk about graphical and visual changes, starting with random world generation. World Gen has seen a massive performance improvement. You can see in this quick test, I've rendered out a 10K map in about 3 minutes and 15 seconds. And after generating a handful of maps, I've noticed that the variety of POI seems to be much better than Alpha 20. And you'll also note that traders are no longer limited to the outskirts of cities. As you move out to the rural areas, you'll also notice that the roads have a more natural pattern that fall in a line with the terrain and elevation shifts. All the existing POIs have been updated to include new block shapes as well as our assets. As you see the example here with Gas Station 4, you'll notice in some situations it was switching out art pieces, but in some it was actually rearranging how the POI was laid out itself. In terms of new questable POIs, we have about a 25% increase for a total of 77 new POIs. Pretty happy with the distribution of these, and particularly the numbers of Tier 4s and 5s look awesome. I've got some of the Tier 4s scrolling in the background right now while we're talking, but I want to do a deep dive into the Tier 5s so you can kind of see the difference in between which ones are new, upgraded, or existing. So we've got 8 total returns turning from Alpha 20, including the three factories, the Shamway factory, the Shotgun Messiah factory, and the Poppin' Pills factory. Then on the skyscraper side of the house, we've got Deshong Tower, Crackabook Headquarters, and Higashi Pharmaceuticals. The last two seem to suffer from a bit of bad RNG on my maps, but 2-Bit Tower and the Navisgain General Hospital. Hopefully in just these overviews, you can see there's some significant updates made to all of these. The Red Mesa installation was formerly a Tier 4 POI, but they've expanded and upgraded it, adding a lot of new art assets and adding a lot of new surprise as you delve below. Also upgraded to Tier 5 is House Modern 23, also known as Dr. Karen Higashi's residence. Throughout the dev streams, they've talked a lot about adding in more around the story of Seven Days to Die and how this outbreak all started, and I have a hunch that this place is going to be a treasure trove. So moving on to the brand new Tier 5 POIs, we've got two prisons, the Navisgain County Jail. This one was interesting because the environmental artists talked a lot about how they did research on the intake of prisoners and how to lay this out. The other prison we have here is Navis Gain Corrections, and this is one I can't wait to see people take over and use as a community base with those towers on the outside and the walls around. Next up we have Vanity Tower. This is a monstrous apartment complex. The environmental devs talked about how each individual room was built to be unique and interesting in this one, so this will definitely be a beast to scale. The Last Sunset, a nursing home, is the final tier 5 that they've added to the array. I'm excited to explore this one because it's so spread out, rather than a lot of the other tier 5 POIs which seem to go straight up and down. In regards to POIs, we also got a new danger meter in the top right of the screen. If you're not inside a POI, it will just show the biome indicator, but as you walk into a POI, it will give you the tier and then the biome following it. These two factors combined will impact both the loot and the game stage. So keep aware of that. And then the biomes are broken up such that the pine forest is zero skulls, the desert is one, snow is 1.5, and the wasteland is two. All of the trader compounds have had a complete overhaul, and you can see that the unique characteristics of them match the specific trader. There's a ton of environmental storytelling going on here and a lot of Easter eggs to find. Also, from a simple quality of life perspective, they've added entrances on all four sides of the traders. We also have new mechanics with the traders, but I'll get to that in the survival section. The new and overhauled POIs have significantly benefited from all the new shapes being implemented. For all you builder types, this brings us to over 2,000 shapes available in Alpha 21. I'm going to be doing a deep dive into all of these in a follow-on video that I'll link in the top right. But I do want to briefly talk about windows because they're no longer glass shapes and instead are standard block shapes. This means you can have a window made out of concrete or steel and you will make them just like you would any other block. So if I come in here and create a concrete block, I can then in turn grab that block and actually go and copy this window shape that I have up here and place it wherever I want. The great thing about these new windows is they have a two tier damage system. So once they take five health, the glass breaks, but can be easily repaired using the same material that you built the window with. So as an example, if I pull out my pickaxe and break the glass here and then keep going, you'll see the block has 5,000 health. Another toy for builders to play with will be the new hatches, doors and garage doors. Hatches now have three tiers, wood, iron, and steel, or the vault hatch as we know it. And you noticed as we went to place it, it's got this arrow indicating which way it will actually open. Now, in terms of upgrades, we no longer have the tier in between the wood and the iron where you could use scrap iron to be able to upgrade. Instead, you'll need to have the next tier of the hatch in your inventory. So for wood, we need an iron hatch. For the iron hatch, we need to have a steel vault in our inventory. 
The last thing to mention is that the iron hatch can no longer be made with scrap iron and instead requires 10 forged iron, so the cost is a little bit higher. Doors will also follow the same upgrade pathway, and we've got a number of new ones to play with, my favorite of which is this incredible new vault door. As doors take damage, they will degrade through multiple tiers of destruction, allowing holes to appear for you to shoot and melee through them. All the workstations have gotten a graphical overhaul, as well as some visual indicators. For the forge, you'll see the advanced bellows show up in the back, and then you'll see the anvil on the stump, and then the crucible to the right. One other key point when planning out your base is that the forge is now two by two. For the campfire, you'll have separate graphical representations as you add the beaker, and then the grill, and then finally the cooking pot. The new workbench doesn't have any tool upgrades, but is coded to allow them in the future and has a quick light indicator showing when things are being crafted. The chem station is the same with no actual tool upgrades, but it does have that light indicator showing that it is currently processing. Also, the chem station is one of the best sources of information on Higashi. You should check out both the front and the back if you're interested more on the lore of Seven Days to Die. The last workstation to bring up is the cement mixer. It also has a visual cue letting you know that it's active. You can see that the cement mixer on the right has a spinning animation versus the one on the left, which is just idle. Next, we have environmental water, which has gotten a massive overhaul. There's some changes to how water fills volumes, which I'll explain in a second, but I wanna talk about how your movement is affected when going through water. Swimming of any type consumes stamina and sprinting in water consumes a lot. So you're gonna have to really think about going across large spaces because if you run out of stamina, it will force you below the water. One nice thing is that while you are under, you can see the surface, which you couldn't see before. The next thing I wanted to take a look at is how the water moves now. I'm using the dev terrain tool to just scoop out a nice hole here and then we're going to use the dev gun to cut out a quick path through and see how the water flows and see if it can fill up this hole here. So in general water is going to take a lot more research. It's still not perfect but you can see that the water is flowing from that larger lake into this body of water here. I've played with this using buckets to try to fill up an area and it seems like you actually have to have a bucket per square that you're filling, so it can get really onerous if you're trying to fill large spaces with water. So overall, I think this is a huge evolution in the water physics for Seven Days to Die. It wraps around cornered edges and things like that really well, and overall just looks a lot better. So I searched through the patch notes several times and don't see this noted at all, but it was definitely noticeable as I played the game. Lighting seems to be more localized, and there's a huge difference between electrical and fire-based lighting in terms of color temperature. Now, the real place I found this to be a game changer was questing during the day. I went out at one point in time and didn't have a torch and got stuck not being able to move through a POI, because honestly, it was just pitch black inside. So if there's not a window or a light source, it's gonna be rough making it through, which I really like, because it adds a ton of atmosphere to the game. So I remember seeing all the assets that Decagon put together for this alpha, and I was like, yeah, no, those don't look really good, but I had no idea until I got into Alpha 21 how much of a difference they made. If I had to compare between Alpha 20 and Alpha 21, Alpha 20 feels sparse and spread out, and when you get into Alpha 21, it feels dense and populated. It just seems like everywhere you look, there's some type of environmental storytelling going on. We have two new flags in game to decorate your base with. Props to the Fun Pimps for adding these in to celebrate the life of Tony, aka Thick44 of Neebs Gaming. This is is a great homage and made only better by what it takes to actually craft this. You'll find out in game. The tagline for Seven Days to Die has always been the survival horde crafting game and they have definitely put the survival back in the game. Drinking water has received a controversial, though in my opinion much needed change. In Alpha 20, water was so abundant that even tracking it was kind of a wasted mechanic. So to bring the game closer to its survival roots, glass jars have been removed and you will no longer find clean water in lootable containers. The ability to drink directly from open water has returned, but you might get the squirts. Additionally, the glue recipe has been changed to require pure water. To combat our thirst, the Fun Pimps have given us the Dew Collector, which produces three pure water over the course of one game day. To create this, you need a modest amount of parts and a water filter. This is a non-craftable item, but really easy to find. The traders almost always have these for 1500 dukes. They are sometimes an optional quest reward, and there's a low chance to loot them from destroyed do collectors. So the hot question on everyone's mind is, how is this gonna actually impact our gameplay? Well, after a week in Survivalist, I'll say not at all. Here's a quick snapshot of my combined inventory after Horde Night. And you can see that I'm sitting on over 30 water. I've got a couple glue, a couple duct tape, and another 190 bones that we could easily make more glue and duct tape from. 
Vehicles have received a combo nerf slash buff. Zombie damage is up significantly and adds the blood spray on, but all vehicles take significantly more damage from any source and seems to be tied directly to velocity. Additionally, you can't repair a vehicle with a single repair kit anymore if it's in rough shape. So here in this vehicle, you'll see we'll give this a go and we only got it back up to 83%. Points in Grease Monkey will increase the effectiveness of that repair kit. So overall, the damage increase wasn't as onerous as I was expecting. It did force me to be a better driver and to avoid the wasteland at all costs on a mini bike. If you do happen to hit zero durability on a mini bike, motorcycle, 4x4 or gyro, you will get this lovely flaming animation. The other resource scarcity that I noticed linked to vehicles is gasoline and specifically the amount that you get from salvaging cars. So I ran this quick experiment in Alpha 20 versus Alpha 21, I came to the conclusion that you get about 50 to 75% less gas from salvaging cars in Alpha 21. The impact of this is that you're going to have to be more thoughtful about driving around and think about upgrading to a chem station faster. I lumped traders in under survival because if food, water, and fuel are your scarcities, the trader is one of the best places to go to resolve those. So we'll start off with the new vending machines over here, which look incredible. And you'll notice that food prices have been increased to be in alignment with what you'd see at Trader, you know, Jen in this case. And then let's check the drink one out. And you're going to notice it's going to have some specialty drinks that you wouldn't have seen before. Uh, you'll have things in here like learning elixir and, you know, all the all the grandmas and grandpas stuff will show up over here. Next, let's talk about a new progression mechanic called Trader Stage. This governs what's available to purchase at any given point in time and has completely taken the place of the secret stash. So if we take a look at her inventory here, you're not going to see anything like motorcycles or gyrocopters, late game stage workstations or, you know, steel or even iron armor at this point. Now that said, she does have it available in her stock. The way it works is that there's a fixed set of items that she's selling during each restock period. And what you are seeing is a filtered version of that based on your trader stage. The calculation for this is pretty straightforward. It's player level times one plus the trader quest tier. That's basically whatever quest tier you have available at that trader. And then plus the level of daring adventure you have times 10. The table on the right here is a simplified version of the game code, which you can see is broken down into different item groups. And then they have basically a min and a max trader stage. So we're gonna use some admin tools to bump our level up to 43 and then recheck her inventory. Well, this bumps us all the way up to 86 game stage and makes a lot more of the items there green. And we'll span through here and take a look. Nothing much on the first few pages, but as we scroll through, there's a compound bow of 44 Magnum and a bunch of other goodies. So the last trader item I wanna talk about are quest rewards, cause they are substantially different. And by different, I mean better in the way Amazing. that it gives you more agency. So like first off, reward. you've got an additional choice for each quest turn in and you're always going to have an option up at the top here for this crafting skill magazine bundle now we're going to go ahead and take that so i can show you what it is but take a look here there's also 10 duct tape i mentioned a lot in comments and responding to people that we would have to see what they did with rng with things like duct tape and glue before we freaked out about water. And this is one way that they use to kind of mitigate that change. But let's go ahead and look at that magazine bundle that we picked up because this is one of the new core mechanics in Alpha 21. And you can see that we get three sets of three magazines. So that's nine magazines there. So speaking of magazines, this is a good segue into the game mechanics portion. So in Alpha 21, all crafting recipes have been removed from perks and you will no longer find those recipes out in loot. The only exception to this is mod schematics. To advance your crafting skill, you'll need to find magazines associated with that skill. But there's a new tab to the right of the perks menu called crafting skills and it's got two pages in it and after each skill you'll see the current skill level and the maximum skill level. Also know that there's some variance in the maximum skill levels that go as low as 20 and as high as 100. The maximum is the number of magazines required to fully cap out that crafting skill. So if we take harvesting tools as an example we are at 59 of 60 so we only need one more magazine to unlock both augers and chainsaws. Also of note you'll see that as you click on each of the tiers it will show you which items you can specifically make within that tier. Since we're right on the cusp of getting an auger, let's go ahead and try reading one tools digest. And you can see that it unlocks harvesting tools, mechanical tools, quality one. So let's shift back into the skills menu and you can see now that we have the ability to make a level one auger. Now, each time you make one of these tier jumps, you're gonna have a tough choice. You can either stick with your level five steel tools, which are gonna have all those mod slots, or you can jump to the mechanical tools, but you're only gonna have a single mod slot. So I think the choice of which you make is largely gonna be dictated by the current mods that you have or have access to. 
So here's where the system gets really interesting. One of the concerns of many people in my comment section, as well as myself, quite honestly, was losing agency through the system and having it be totally RNG. So here's where the magic of this system kicks in. All of the perks in green here will influence your chance of getting associated magazines. This has an interesting effect of pushing you away from straight up min-maxing in the beginning of the game and instead kind of taking a few different skills so that you can make sure that you get the associated magazines to advance. All in all, I found this new dynamic refreshing and actually a really nice change of pace. While we have the perks all up here, let's go ahead and talk about the overhaul. We'll start off with the dinosaur in the room and that's that sexual Tyrannosaurus has been removed. The stamina benefits have been reincorporated into the various melee perks currently highlighted. This is a great change that will take away that requirement to spend at least a certain amount of points in strength just to max Sexy Rex, so I expect to see a lot of new builds as a result. In a similar vein, Flurry of Blows was removed and replaced by an individual perk in each of the perk trees. So Quick and Perceptive will increase the attack speed of Spears, Big and Fast will increase the speed of Clubs and Sledges, Lightning Hands will increase the speed of Fists and Fist Weapons, Whirlwind increases the speed of Knives, and finally Calculated Attack increases the Baton on attack speed. So these next few perks got a little love because they lost their crafting unlocks. Starting with Physician, it gained a couple of cool new abilities. One, it can treat sprains. When we get it up to level four, it gives a boost to batons on dismemberment. And then at level five, a chance to instantly kill a target with a stun baton. Since Master Chef was really only there to unlock recipes, it now has the advantage of cooking faster because they've upped the cooking times. Additionally, it allows you to use less resources. Lastly, Grease Monkey has the ability to be able to repair vehicles with fewer repair kits. There's a new type of quest called Infestation, and basically this operates as a clear quest, except for that there's a multiplier on the number of zombies, making it a little bit more difficult. Additionally, the rewards will be one tier higher than what the quest indicated, and you'll also get one more box with the end loot called an Infested Cache. Once you have your trader fully leveled up, this does allow you to get tier six rewards from tier five Infestation quests. A couple weapons have received much needed buffs. Starting with a spear, they've removed the throw attack and replaced it with a power attack. Damage has been buffed, and they have completely overhauled the associated books with this. Volume 3 gives a 25% chance to cause bleeding damage. Volume 4, power attacks do damage to down targets. 6 allows for penetrating multiple targets. 7 gives you more damage with quick succession hits. And finally, when you get all of them, you get that good old perk that refills your stamina on kills. The rifle class has received a bonus to headshot damage. I played around with this and did notice that most headshots once you connect are a one-shot kill. Rifles normally aren't my jam, but honestly, after playing with this a little bit, I might consider giving them a go. Zombies have gotten some behavioral as well as graphical changes. So when you're out hunting, you're gonna have to be careful because those zombies might just get to your food before you manage to. To increase engagement with wandering hordes, they've increased the drop rate of loot bags on wandering hordes. The crawler zombie got some jiggly bits hanging out the back end and movement just looks a little bit sharper with this guy. Good luck, buddy. Last up on our zombie friends is dismemberment. I'm gonna take my buddy Tim Recky's recommendation and blur this out because YouTube often flags these as educational videos. Next, I wanna hit on a few really good quality of life updates. When you're loading into the game, you have the option to enable chunk reset time. Now, I don't think I'd ever use this in a single player game, but for multiplayer, this will allow resources to respawn like cars, mining nodes, and things like that to allow for more playability on the same map. The electrical system is one of my favorite components in Seven Days to Die, and I spent a ton of Alpha 20 going out of my way to hide cables so things look clean like this, as opposed to like this. But now you don't have to worry about it because as long as you have the wire tool in your hand, you'll be able to see cables, but as soon as you take it out of your hand, all those unsightly cables just disappear. Crafting is gonna be much easier as we now have the ability to pin recipes, or track them as they call it. So once you track this, you'll get a list of the components you need to make that on the right side of the screen. And then as you add them to your inventory, it'll show you the number that you're picking up so that you know when you have everything necessary to be able to build whatever you're trying to build. Speak of building, ever have one of those situations where you're going to build a new tool or something and you go to try to build it and you're just shy of the materials necessary? Well, now you can actually build a lower level version. There's now an indicator in the bottom left screen that lets you know when armor pieces have started to become weak. As you continue to take damage, you'll also see it will pivot over to the critical state, letting you know that the armor is about to fail. 
So the last thing I want to talk about is performance, and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail because I'm going to do a follow-up video and analysis on this. So starting off currently in the forest biome here on medium settings, and frames are sitting anywhere between 90 and about 110. Here's high settings, and it looks like we're taking a little bit of a hit. So we're down to, you know, 80, 90 frames. And this puts us down into the 70 to 80 frame range. Let's jump on over to the cities and see how it looks there. So here we are in Crackabook's headquarters on medium settings and seems to be solidly sitting right in the 50s in terms of frames. Jumping up to high, it looks like we lose about five or 10 ish. We're down in the 40s. And finally jumping up to ultra and only it seems like a minor hit there. The overall performance isn't quite where I was hoping that it would get to, but it is definitely a little bit smoother. It definitely is not worse. More analysis and videos to come on this in the days ahead. Hey folks, it's Echo here. If you're new, welcome to the channel. I do a ton of content around seven days to die. I also love charity work. Uh, I do stuff with extra life and stack up ones for veterans and ones for children's health care. Um, but otherwise, I am so excited about Alpha 21, folks. Uh, as I kind of opened up the video, I do think that this is the Alpha that maybe you didn't want or even ask for, but it is the Alpha that we truly needed. I think that this is a game changer. It pulls the graphics into a modern era. Um, I had so much fun exploring and kind of learning some of the new mechanics, and I've got a ton of videos planned uh, moving forward to share with y'all. So I hope you've enjoyed. Take care, folks. I'll see you soon. Echoes out. Wait, folks, don't go quite yet. I gotta thank these folks over here for being amazing and incredible supporters. Thank you so much. And if you're interested in joining my Patreon, you get access to download bases, find out what's happening behind the scenes, and learn about my new crazy YouTube studio I'm building. Until then, take care, folks. Echoes out.